Ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Mixed Grill podcast. What's the Mixed Grill? It's a platform to hear different people, to hear different stories, to engage with you, to entertain you, and to bring those things to light that you're talking about on the breakfast table, when you're at a cafe, when you're chilling with your friends, when you're moaning to your partner after a long day at work. We discuss absolutely everything. Now, it's my absolute pleasure to say that today I've got a phenomenal personality with me. I'm gonna bear her blushes and uh, introduce her straight away. Uh, YouTuber, blogger, mom, wife, um, content creator. I'm running out of things to say. Amina Khan, welcome to the Mixed World. Thanks for having me. Okay, I just want to say something. Amina has been telling her husband off all weekend, so uh, her voice is gone. And I know her husband, uh, so I know the poor guy doesn't say anything back. I'm only joking. Uh, anyway, uh, Amina, uh, the first thing I want to say, who are you, man? Like, you know, when I go online and I see all of your content, like, like how would you describe yourself, Amina? Because I've spoken to so many people. They all know you. They all know Amina Khan, the brand. But to you, if you had to describe yourself, who is Amina? Technically, I'm an influencer. Okay. But I don't really feel like one. You don't feel like one? No. Because well, I don't know mean? what the hell I'm doing. I just kind of go with the flow. Has that always been the case? Yeah, I can't. I, I literally cannot brand myself in the way that I see generally influencers doing. Like if you go on my Instagram, there's no consistent theme. It's just everything. Okay. And my content reflects that as well. So there's a bit of madness to this. Yeah. You just wake up. And you feel as though this might be interesting to people yeah. I'm influencing. And do, uh, uh, do you feel you're influencing people? No, I feel like this is a community of people. I kind of envision a group of women generally. And they're similar to me and they have similar interests to me. And we're all in this group together on this journey. And it's a really inclusive, nice place. What do I want to share with, these, with my ladies? Mm. Like That's how I take it. I mean, when was the last time you cried? <laughs> like properly cried not because you saw uh, like a cute dog Titanic <laughs> no yeah no, no, none of that stuff when was the last time you like cried I cry properly like every couple of days w what just for fun existential crisis <laughs> um, yeah I'm a pretty emotional person I never used to cry before kids I rarely cried or someone will tell you that yeah yeah okay fine um I'm When's the last time you cried? When was the last time I cried? Uh, men need to talk more about crying. Yeah, I mean, this is, this, this, today's episode is not about me. I don't know if you know. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I, cr I cried a couple of days ago because I saw a picture uh, of my late mum. And it just reminded me of loads of stories. And I just sat there um, with, my, with my missus. And she's, she's amazing. So I, I was able to, yeah, I just, just cried. Just cried. Uh, but you're right, men don't cry enough. And we don't talk about crying enough. Um, did you? D d would your husband cry in front of you? He has cried in front of me, but he rarely cries. That, in fact, the kid said the other day, "Dada, we've never seen you crying." Is it? I guess he just has such a great life. Ha uh, you know, um, <laughs> your. Sorry, I, I should have laughed there, but uh, <laughs> really, um, growing up, did you see? Uh, did you see your dad cry? Yeah, I did see my dad cry. Yeah. You did see your dad. Mm -hmm. And w uh, did you have a relationship with your dad where you could just go up to him randomly when you were younger and just cuddle him? 100%. Okay. I'm a daddy's girl. Okay, fine. And do you have brothers? No, four sisters. Four sisters. It's like oh, little wow. women. What was that like? What was that like? Have you watched up? the movie Little Women? No, I haven't. I haven't. Well, these girls kind of find their own paths into creativity and escape. And that's kind of like how me and my sisters were. Uh, would you say you had a liberal upbringing? Mm, what do you mean by liberal? Like, um, 
uh, how strict were your parents? Pretty strict. Like I wasn't allowed to go out with my friends. Okay. If that's what you mean by yeah. So like, like after college and uni, could you could you say to your mum, mum, I'm going to get some food with my friends? Yeah, after college and uni, like uni, I moved out, so okay. she couldn't do anything. She couldn't about do anything. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I mean, they were liberal in that. You know, when I dyed my hair bright pink, mum shrieked, but she was kind of okay with it. Ah, uh, okay. They were a liberal. Semi, a, semi liberal. Yeah. Yeah, but what? then in other ways, it was like uh, we weren't really allowed to do much as well. Um, so you come from a uh, Muslim Indian background. Yeah. Where are your parents from? Hyderabad. Hyderabad. Do you know oh, about Hyderabadi biryani. culture? It's all about biryani. Hell yeah. But do you know anything else beyond that? Um, I know that uh, uh, Shah Rukh Khan, the great Shah Rukh Khan, of course. has his Masi, so his Khala, was from Hyderabad. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I know uh, there was a <gasps> massive Bollywood comedian called Mahmood. Yeah, he my was, dad loves him. Yeah, he was from Hyderabad. Oh, I didn't know that. To me, they do all that stuff, innit? To me, yeah, yeah, to yeah, me, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, and that's all I know. That's all I know. Okay, so uh, is that a, is that a quite a religious structure? Like, were you expected to pray five times? Were you expected? To, how religious were you expected to be? Yeah, we had to pray, and yeah. that's it. And we couldn't question anything. You couldn't question anything. But they weren't so sort of conservative in that. For example, when I started to wear hijab. Nobody was happy about it in my family. Okay, so they were like, the "Why are you doing that?" Out of the four daughters, you were the first to wear the hijab. Yeah, I was the only one to, in like my ex entire extended family. Are you the eldest sibling? No, second. Okay, right. The second ones have all the fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my elder brother uh, wasn't allowed anything, and I was allowed to do everything. Um, but okay, w w why did you start wearing the hijab? Very personal reasons. Um, I mean, predominantly, it was the one and only way that I felt I could connect with God. Wow. Yeah. It was the it was the one reason. And only, bearing in mind, I grew up, you know, like I said, praying. But it was very, like, robotic. Ah. A lot of South Asian kids were, in my generation, were kind of raised that way. Don't question anything. Do that. And a lot of culture was dressed up as religion as and well. Islam was very rigid. Yeah. But it was mostly, like, cultural. It was rigid. It's not really rigid, but it was rigid. Okay, take me back. Um, Do you know what I mean? Like, it was very cultural, though. Okay. A lot of, like, expectations. Like, yes, I could go to university and work, but I better find a husband and settle down. Yeah, and he's going to be the breadwinner. Maybe, maybe not. No, I guess my mum, when she came here, she kind of, her mind opened a bit to kind of accept the fact that we wanted to work. Uh -huh. And she was like, that's good. But at the same time... Who named you? Who named you Amina? It's actually Amina, but my parents spelled it wrong. <laughs> right, okay. Um, I don't know. I think my grandma maybe suggested it. I'm not actually sure. Does that name like connect with you in any way? 100%. Like it's the name of the mum of the Prophet. The Prophet the Prophet. And so I connected with it on a really deep level growing up. And it's also connected to honesty. Uh -huh. It's. I think it's tied to Amin. Amin and Amana, the, both the words, yeah, the root words. And oh, it's wow. uh, like it's yeah c connected to loyalty, honesty, things that actually... I resonate with on a really deep level and I always did, so. Okay, I want to open this up, right? So where were you, where were your mum and dad when you said to them, I want to wear a hijab? <laughs> they were just at home, I walked in with it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> on, <laughs> that's you, it. You just got a random hijab. I you, just walked in with it, wearing <laughs> it. There was no discussion. I do what I want to do, I, I don't discuss. Get it off your head. <laughs> they were like, first they thought I was praying. About to pray. Ah, okay, okay. And then? And then like I was wearing it out and they were like, what are you doing? And then I won't name another family member more than once sat me down and they were like, what are you doing? Are you okay? And did they think you look ugly? No, they just thought it was too much. Like it's, it, it, it's, it's too extreme? To an extent, yeah. You know, if you were sat But home, this is post 9-11, right? So they were kind of scared for me as well. Ah, but then. Okay. Yeah. Look, the Hyderabadi culture, although yeah, I yeah, don't think me, this is connected, know. is very theatrical. It's very like... Belly up. But it's just all very so grand. Yeah. Like, you lot think you're some big boys, isn't it? You lot think like you're better I than mean, normal people. I mean, it's a fact. You think you're better than normal people, isn't it? Hyderabad... It goes without saying. That they <laughs> no, only, uh, only where it applies to our biryani. Um, growing up, did you go out for... Uh, would your dad ever buy your mum flowers? 
or say to her, I love you and give her a hug in front of you? We'd buy the flowers and give it to dad and tell him to give it to mum. So he wasn't very... No, actually, uh -huh. can I say, I'm sure my parents, will, if they hear this, they'll be so embarrassed. In later years, we discovered a briefcase. You know, all us Asians, our dads have a briefcase. It's like mysterious object that we've never opened. We cracked it open when they were in India. We found love letters, guys. From your mum? From my dad to my mum. Oh, that's all right. I thought it was another woman. Ah! <laughs> never. <laughs> never. Oh, so this was a love marriage? No. Love my it. parents got married on my mum's 16th birthday. That was the first time they met. Are they both Hyderabadi? Yeah. So your dad must be quite like romantic. Like he must be good with his no. wife. No. Yeah, well, he isn't normally, but then we found, go figure, we found this suitcase. And then I went I mean, to my mum, I was like... I four kids, so he's pretty romantic. <laughs> I went to my mum, I was like, what are you on about, Dad's not romantic? Look at these love letters. Bless him. And what did she say when you said that to her? Did she feel embarrassed? Typical Hyderabadi mum. She went, she just grunted. I can't even make the sound. She just went, uh. So do you speak, so what do you, uh, what is your <laughs> actual language? Is Hyderabadi... Urdu. Urdu, okay. But it's got a twang to it, hasn't it? It's different to normal Urdu, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, our dialect is... Weird. Do you know, for years we thought, like me and my missus, and we thought you were Pakistani. Did yes. you? Is it the Khan? Khan, and you just, you, you, I don't, I don't know if this is alright to say, but you look Pakistani. <laughs> like, maybe because we don't know many Hyderabadi people, uh, but you look. Yeah, Hyderabadis are like incredibly even diverse. Your husband looks Pakistani. Do you think so? Yeah. I think Pakistani. he looks Italian. <laughs> Each to their own. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, right. Um, Amina. <laughs> Uh, when was the first time you thought I want to, uh, or I'm confident enough, or I've got an idea that I want to put on online? How did that thought come in your mind? <coughs> a lot of people want to know this. So I, <coughs> I, I put out on social media that I'm going to be chatting to Amina and a lot of people said, like, sh you are seen, I don't, I, I don't want to use this word, but you are seen as a bit of a pioneer. You're one of the first people to really do it on that level. Uh, for especially the British Asian scene. When did you think, oh, I want to create content and, and put it online? Growing up, it was a dream of mine <coughs> to be a presenter on TV. To be a presenter on TV, okay. Yeah, but you just didn't see brown people doing that. So mm. I was like, mm, that's never going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So I pursued other avenues, as you do. Yeah. Back then, back in my day, obviously it was before social media, so yeah. you just didn't know that anything was possible, but I had a dream, right? Mm. I went into teaching on my maternity leave Hubsy Love got me a laptop. Oh, so this happened after your, after your, after your marriage? Mm -hmm. you be, you, okay, all right, fine. I, I was on maternity leave. Oh, wow. After my first baby. Okay. And I had a laptop, an Apple Mac with a built-in webcam. Uh-huh. And I just made a video on that and I put it up. What was the video? <clears throat> How to tie a headscarf. Oh. I think that was my very, very first one. Hijab tutorial? Yeah. But then, like I said, I could never stay focused. So I was like sharing baby products that I enjoy, books that I enjoy, random tips that I just couldn't wait to share with the world. Anything and everything. Okay. And so I just kind of could have, I couldn't kind of contain that part of myself. And I uploaded it not thinking anything could happen. I was probably one of the first couple of influencers to get paid to do what I do. And, and, and just for a complete novice, how do you get paid? Is it like you get a certain amount of views? Or how, how does it work? So there's AdSense, uh -huh. which initially that was on YouTube. I didn't even get that. I think for three years I was just making content for the because I enjoyed it. Oh, wow. And then brands came along. So the creative director for Bobby Brown found my videos, my very, very first videos. And she got in touch and was like, you know, you're really good on camera. Do you want to make some content? I was like, hell yeah. And then she was like, I'll pay you. I was like, oh, wow, yeah. Oh, mad. <laughs> so... Yeah, like, okay. That's how it now, was don't good. give me a humble answer. When was the first time you thought to yourself, I'm famous? Like, I'm famous. People love me. There must have been a point. There must have been. Otherwise, you're just pretending to be humble. I don't. No, I'm not pretending to be humble because you're not like a list celebrity. You're not famous as such. You're just somebody that has happened to made. Do thousands happened to of have people made know you? Thousands of people. Yeah, but know thousands you. of people know a lot of influence. Like everybody's and you're an influencer. Thousands no, of people know you. Okay, so the first time I realized that what we have here is something that is groundbreaking uh -huh. was several years ago, before the influencer market became so saturated. I'm using all these marketing terms now. 
when there was a handful of us kind of uh-huh. we were in dubai and i put up a message on my instagram and instagram was fairly new and i was like hey ladies you want to meet up for a coffee because it has been from day one and it continues to to this day for me to be about genuine connection with other like-minded women okay mm. so as on my instagram as like, hey ladies i'm in dubai should we meet up in i don't know what mall it was in one of the costas or something mm-hmm. i figured like 5 or 10 women would turn up mm-hmm. how many turned up and like that is how many women replied to me on my post cuz i don't get like millions of comments they were like yeah i'll turn up i was like cool 10 of us will sit and talk about life as mums as working women uh-huh. as souls on this earth you know so i went there thinking cool and then like we got basically stampeded it was like 200 people that came and like security <laughs> had to escort us out through the back and i was like what the hell's going on and they even like the security guard was like who are you i was like yeah who am i why are all these people here So there's like initially there was like See, maybe about 100 people that's then the but difference. then more people just it's the what's it called the the effect of seeing a crowd I don't know if there's a scientific study uh-huh. but so the initially there was like maybe 100 people they were kind of cute and I was like that's fine uh-huh. and then I think more people just saw and they just kind of latched on so like by the time a stampede formed which was like more than 200 maybe that 300 right crazy a lot of those people still didn't know who i was they kind of just saw that there was this person there there was like a bit of a ripple effect people saw people so i still didn't think oh my god there's so many people but i was like okay this is interesting because this thing called social media which is like a lab experiment actually has the potential to be extremely powerful uh-huh. and influential in its own right it's bigger than me oh, wow. and that's when i thought holy Wow, yeah. like this is going to be huge. Mm. And you could see that there was something growing in those early stages. Okay. That's when you yeah, okay. That's when you thought this could go on to be something mad. Yes. Okay. It wasn't about oh like this many people turned up. I was like, okay. You saw the potential. And also what the hell is this algorithm? Mm. Because I thought 10 people would turn up. How come like what is going on? Obviously hundreds of people saw it. Not everybody responded, but people came, right? Mm. And in Dubai, right? Like random. I didn't even think how people there. But people who came there had hopped a plane from somewhere nearby to come. Wow. Amina, uh 16-year-old girls who <coughs> fancy a lad in college or school, uh their body's changing. their relationship with their parents is changing uh how they perceive life is changing um see you as a bit of an authority or inspiration is that scary i was a people pleaser and so i kind of thought what can i do to please that person's parents and uh-huh. like i obviously i i know that younger girls follow but ultimately i kind of just thought i'm going to be myself and if i'm good enough for my kids then I consider myself good enough for your kids. <laughs> How many kids do you have? <laughs> Two. Boy and girl? Yeah. Uh, who's el- who's the other one? Ibrahim is the boy. He's 13 and Alina is 11. Does Ibrahim and Alina know or do they know their mom's Amina Khan? They're no? embarrassed of me. Like all kids. Oh, they're well, my kids are so embarrassed of me. Who named your kids? Let's not talk about them because I'm going to get told off talking about them. Okay, okay, fine. fine. <laughs> who who named your kids? Um I named Ibrahim because I was I always wanted to name my son Ibrahim. Uh-huh. The na- name means a lot to me on a spiritual level. So when I got pregnant, I was like no one's having a say. I'm the vessel, I'm naming the baby. And that's it. Osama was too scared by that point because I was a raging hormonal pregnant woman <laughs> to do anything. But then I was like, babe, the next baby, guess what? You can name the next baby. How nice of Fully you. planning on not having How more babies. How nice of you. Yeah. I mean he is fully involved in the making of that baby. Thank you for giving yeah. him a No, but I didn't. The thing is, I wasn't intending on having more babies. Okay. So I was like, mm-hmm. I've got the last laugh here. Then when I got pregnant again, I was like, oh, I've got a list and he was like, no. You gave me I was like, oh. you uh were a very um let's put it out there. You were a very very Muslim social media influencer according to perception, according to what people thought, right? Did anyone start thinking that you because I've seen this firsthand 
Did anyone start thinking that you're an authority in religion? Of course. Did people start thinking that you're this pious, knowledgeable woman? Hey, why can't I be pious no, no. and knowledgeable? But I'm not a sheikh. Yeah. I can't you're give... You're not qualified, basically. I can't give fatwas. Yeah. Right. I'm an average person. Fatwa is a legal ruling for anybody who yeah. is wondering, uh, which a qualified scholar of of a certain caliber, not even just any scholar, but a certain caliber can give. Uh, and so that's what I'm asking. So did people start thinking that Amina is a religious authority? Yeah. Uh, give me an example. Like how? Or, 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 yeah, I, I want to hear a story about someone asking you something. Or What's the permissibility of X, Y, and Z? Well, so if I was traveling... DMing you or whatever. Yeah, DMing me. And also in comments, but not only questioning your decisions and what you do, but also actually posing the question like, I really, for example, girls going to uni, I really want to go to uni, which is outside of my city. But Islamically, I'm not allowed to travel without a mahram, without, you know, yeah. by myself as a female, single female. I can't travel by myself, so how come you are? How come you are? Did mm -hmm. add that one as well? No, yeah, yeah. But, but no, I mean, people's tone is different, right? But yeah. Usually, people are very well intentioned and genuinely asking, you know, as you would ask your sister or your mate, like, what's your reasoning? Because ah. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to understand. And maybe I'll agree with you and I'll take the same step. Did that get frustrating and annoying? No, I felt this incredible pressure to actually go and learn and become scholarly. Which did you? I mean, yeah, I would like ask and I would research and I would like, I took it as like my personal obligation. To but help that's that not person. yeah but that's not i don't feel now that mm -hmm. my faith compels me to do that if people expect that of me that was my personality at the time of being a people pleaser and so i thought i better go find this out because people are going to ask me and i and i have to have the answer and i have to answer them like no concept of boundaries that i can say actually no <laughs> you're not talking about boundaries right you know when you're online People seem to think that they know you, like they're a part of your family sometimes. Like, have you ever had an experience where someone just got a bit too close? I don't mean like a guy or anything. I mean like just a, a, a young girl or someone who follows your journey. They just yeah. feel as though like, like, not they own you, but like you have to answer them or they ha you have to let them in. Have you ever had that? Yeah, the nature of being on social media, for me anyway, because I'm just me, right? I uh -huh. don't, I genuinely want people to benefit and enjoy life and mm. be happy mm -hmm. and be supported mentally especially mm -hmm. right especially women especially women from the south asian community mm -hmm. so if they feel like i'm part of their family or they know me i think that's actually really nice yes sometimes it can creepy. go yeah like i've had people show up to my old house what because they found yeah because i didn't know what i was doing right so when i registered my company that i had at the time uh -huh. I didn't register it to my accountant's address. I did it to my home address. Because uh -huh. why wouldn't I? I'm just... You want to know, it, yeah. Who's going to want to know where I live? Apparently people did. And they turned up? Yeah. And, and what did they do? Just knocked on the door? Yeah. I've come all the way from wherever it was I, 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 to meet you. And who hey, sister. <laughs> you opened the door. As in, you opened the door and some <laughs> random guy said, or oh, girl, that I've come to see you from here. Yeah, I didn't. I happened not to open the door at the time my husband did. And I think my sister was there at one point. It never, it happened twice. It, thank God, both times I wasn't there to open the door. Because I probably would have like hugged him and be like, come in for a tea, we'll chill together. But that's so inappropriate, right? That, uh, I could have been an axe murder, dude. Like, I don't know <laughs> what to say to that. Okay, what are the challenges of being uh, a woman? a young, attractive woman uh, in the, the the world of social media and being married. What do you mean? Like, does it does it ever... I, I know you've got a great relationship and, and God keep it that way, but is it like, is it hard for your husband sometimes to accept that so many people know so much about you or so many people want to connect with you does it impact your marriage? No, but he is less inclined to be open to having that kind of exposure. Mm. Yeah. Okay. He's happy with it, but up to a point. Um, and he recently went back into interior design, whereas Abzi and I were working side by side for 12 years. Mm -hmm. 
as in he's fully like managing a lot of my stuff. Yeah. I was doing. It was your it was your content manager creator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think from my perspective, I don't know whether he'll agree, but he seems to me to be so much happier to have that distance mm. from social media because it can be a lot of pressure because people think they know you personally and then he worries for my safety. If it's like a meet and greet, generally it's mostly women. Mm. And the boys that do come, they're just really chill and respectful. Okay. Yeah. All right, fine. Thankfully, I don't, yeah, I haven't, don't really feel uncomfortable. Talk to in me. That sense. Talk to me about um, uh, moral police and people who feel as though they should tell you what to do, uh, either morally, ethically, religiously, how to run your family. How do you deal with that? And do you get that a lot? Yeah, oh my God. I think everybody on social media gets it. Especially if what you're you? sharing so much of your life, right? Mm -hmm. The way that you parent, the this, the that. Look, a lot of it is, I, I personally believe most people are good. So a lot of it is so well-intentioned. So I might be eating, I don't know, Skittles. Someone or a couple of people will message and say, that's not halal sister. kind okay. of. Okay. By the way, it's got this in it or whatever. That sounds genuine, doesn't it? That's fine. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, yeah. But what about if someone says you know, to you, what if someone says to you, oh, your, your clothes are too tight or your hair's not right or I don't know what would you say to that how do you react to, does it upset you uh, it used to in the very beginning upset me a lot is it yeah because look it's really hard if you don't I didn't grow up around a lot of Muslims I didn't have a lot of Muslim friends so when you become so suddenly um, emphatically identifiably Muslim uh -huh. looking yeah sorry yeah, yeah. looking looking you don't expect I don't know I just thought people just mind their own business apparently people don't <laughs> Yeah. So you're not used to it, and so it's hard to adjust. But that's the nature of social media, isn't it? Mm. That's what people do. And I think you kind of expect for people to have the same kind of respect that you have towards them. Uh -huh. Like, I know people who are Muslim. I just know so many diverse kinds of people who are both Muslim and not Muslim and practice very differently. There's people who will eat only this type of chicken, HMC or whatever. Right? Okay, yeah. so this is the... This is an example of just how diametrically opposed people can be. There'll be people who are like HMC or non-HMC, stunned or not stunned. Um, I don't care if it's not halal, I'm gonna say bismillah and eat it. I'll eat it if it's kosher. And then there's me who's like, I don't consider it personally for me if it's not been organically raised in an ethical environment and been slaughtered, the chicken that is of course, slaughtered I without talking, I thought you were talking about your husband oh. <laughs> without having had to see its family being killed yeah. for me that's not okay All right? so you must be spending a lot of, I think I get three <laughs> chickens for 10 pounds or something <laughs> you must be <laughs> how expensive I chicken? was it's so hard to find halal organic mate um, yeah okay. but I mean but that's for me I don't impose that onto the rest of my family they can do what they want I mean what's you your know? big I mean what's your biggest regret <clears throat> does it I don't have any everything's a learning experience don't say that, please. God, Everybody. that's a really hard one. What's your biggest regret? This will buy me time to think. <laughs> uh, not getting this far. <laughs> and not, <laughs> losing weight earlier. I regret not having treated myself with more kindness and gentility Yourself? and forgiveness. Yeah. Okay. In my earlier years. I, reg I do regret that. To some extent. I don't actually believe in regrets, but if I had to regret something, it would, that would be... Regret. As in you were ruthless to yourself, like in terms of like you were just not letting your mind rest, your body rest, and you were just creating loads of content? Or w what does that mean? I was extremely self-critical. Ah. My inner critic basically took over my entire life and I was just very negative towards myself. I was my biggest, harshest critic. Really? Yeah, and I didn't leave room for humanity because to be human is to be able to make mistakes and to be human is to trip over sometimes and that's okay to hold yourself see people kind of in especially in this hustle culture it's all about hustling and you know just go 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 and that's a really unhealthy way to live your life mm. and it again people glorify perfectionism at the same time working hard and being a perfectionist oh i'm such a perfectionist that's actually incredibly destructive mm. it's not a nice way to live like that so I so I, I would have gone easier on myself like, a, a, a time when you've been really harsh on yourself I was in labor and I was working man like I oh. was literally in labor 
I went into the hospital. I wanted a fully natural labor. They wanted to induce me to cut a long story short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, nope, I don't want that. They were like, fine, you can go home. And I was like, I was like five or six centimeters. Like I was in labor. And then, so I was like, okay, I'll go home. So I went home. I had these emails to sort out from my suppliers. At the time I had a hijab company, Pal Daisy. Um, and I knew that, okay, if I have the baby today, I'm gonna have to be doing this and this, and I won't get back to my supplier in time. And that supplier was in China. So by the time they woke up, I wanted them to have the email. It's just this whole crazy, if you like that, <laughs> if you think that way, you'll understand what I mean. Um, so I went home and I was like on Excel and emailing my supplier and stuff. That is madness. That's kind of crazy. Like, why did I do that? <laughs> why did you do that? You're obsessed with results probably. Or just just wanted I to just, achieve. I was a what's called a human doing instead of a human being. Okay. Sometimes one has to just be. Be. And just accept that this is it. This is fine. Mm. This can be the happiness that you so desire. It doesn't have to be some point in the future that you never obtain. Ah. Uh. Right. You can just be. You don't have to constantly do do do. But. Sometimes, you know, that's, yeah, that's really people important. do that to run away from their problems oh. and their internal pain. And you were taking everyone's opinions a bit Yeah, because maybe. everyone's opinion counted more than my own. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of women, especially South Asian women, we're raised, we are conditioned to be that way. I would argue actually women in general. Mm. I've never seen my husband feel so unsure about what he's saying or feel insecure about himself in the way that I felt insecure about myself and not feeling not good enough as much as I felt not good enough mm -hmm. or at least certainly he's not shared that with me in fact that's one of the things that I love about him that I've learned from but then it does certainly it made me question why I was that way mm. and it also affect of course impacts me as as a mum and how yeah. I raise my kids uh, you're saying there's still women out there who I know there are can't make their own choices yeah I know there are have they reached Look, out to you I've ever? not only witnessed it, I've heard friends talk about it and they DM me a hell of a lot. Mm. I had to get distance from my DMs and that's when I started to create these boundaries because it was affecting me. I had women telling me about all sorts of assault, about oh all sorts of things that I, they would DM me and I would internalize it and it was really affecting me mentally. Wow. Wow. And did, did you feel like you needed to do something about it at the time or did you just feel you just had to distance? I used to rant quite a lot. Oh, like on your own platform and stuff. Mm. And did that yeah. not end in a good way either? I mean, it was fine. It was okay. But I think it was more very like knee jerk reaction-y. Mm. Instead of just taking some distance and thinking, what can I actually do about it? What is going to impact change? Mm. Do you want to rant? And have everybody go, yeah, 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 blah, 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 share, viral, blah, blah, blah. Is that actually making good? Like getting, it's really easy to appeal to the most, the common denominator in people, which is rage. Uh. And sometimes, not rage, but anger can create change. But there are other routes that I think are more effective, mm. which is the consistent day to day. How can you impact change by just the small day to day things and Little just things. being yourself? Other that. than, you know, appealing to that part of people all the time. I mean, I'm not criticizing anybody else. Yeah. That's just how I live my life. Yeah. Mm. So why did you take the hijab off, Amina? Personal reasons. What's the personal reason? Spill, spill, <coughs> spill. Uh, tell me about your deepest, <laughs> darkest secrets. <laughs> I wish I of course did. you do. We all do. The, what do you want to know? <laughs> there's certain parts of us that are not privy for the entire, to the pr entire world, course, you know? Of course, of course. And I think to some extent, I mistakenly gave the impression that Everything particularly as Muslim women, we have to answer to every single question about our faith and why we do the things that we do. And I think that also sets up actually a false idea of who we are mm. because we are so diverse, because women wear it for so many different reasons. Reasons. Proportionately speaking, I won't be able to tell you. There are women who wear it because fashion. Mm -hmm. Some women wear it out of culture. Mm -hmm. Some women wear it because everybody in their family does. That's a natural, normal way of them mm -hmm. being. Some women wear it because they feel closer to God for it. A lot of women do probably. I, mm -hmm. I hope. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Um, Some women wear it because they genuinely can't be asked to do anything with their hair or they're self-conscious about their hair. Mm -hmm. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, shame over their hair. Some women do wear it for that yeah. as well. Some it, com women, it covers their hair. Some women wear it because they're forced to wear it. Some women wear it because they've been emotionally blackmailed into wearing it. You know? What I'm asking, 
uh, I know we had a laugh and all that stuff, and of course there's some things that are very very mm. personal and private. But w- was it a process? Was it a period of time that you were thinking about it, or was it a particular day where you thought, you, or mm. like ha- that there process? There was a period of yeah. time, but a very short time. Uh-huh. It was similar to when I wore it. It was I made a snap oh, decision. Quick decision. Yeah. I follow my heart. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, this had implications. Yeah. Obviously, <laughs> right? Yeah. There is what people would say so much at stake branding and da 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 and work and da da and it's awful if you think about it D- you know did taking it off was one of the reasons that you felt that this doesn't define my relationship with god is that it never did i can't be not myself it is a, i cannot do it it's not in me to, to be that way i would become depressed yeah. so i had people being like you know why do it now why not doing it slowly why does it have to be such a big shock why can't you do it gradually why can't you da, 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 da. and i was like but i'm going to be out in leicester looking a certain way and i'm like online wearing a scarf mm. and then being that person i'm sorry i can't do that have you become it just doesn't feel right to me not be, being have you become less i know this is this might sound silly. Have you become less religious mm. after taking off the hijab? No. No. I've become more religious, I would say. I say that tentatively because, you know, religiosity. That's what I want to hear, I want to hear yeah. Religiosity. It's very personal. It can't really be measured because for everyone, no matter whether or not they believe, I don't care how pious somebody proclaims to be, faith is like this. Fluctuates. Always, like maybe overall it's going like that. But one day you might like that, be like that, and the other day you might be like that because you've lost someone or something mm. has happened to you, or you've been triggered by something, or you know, and that's okay. Mm. There shouldn't be a pressure to be like all the time. Mm. Change the topic a bit. Uh, three people that you would want to sit down and just learn from. Three people, right? And they could be uh, dead or alive. First one would be. Uh, there used to be this older lady called Sister Anise at university. She was the first woman to look at me with the purest non-judgmental eyes mm-hmm. when I came into like the Islamic society in uni. Oh, okay, I with saw, my, yeah. yeah, with my bright blue hair and like, and she just like treated me as just like everybody else. Normal, yeah. And her and her husband, they didn't have kids. So they kind of almost made us their kids. And I found that so inspirational to be able to live your life in such an open, pure way. To be able to see someone like me, who I didn't consider myself to be like, really, I didn't think that I could be religious looking that way. And because I know I was made to feel like I was not religious enough. Mm -hmm. I just found that so, such a, it was such a breath of fresh air. Sister and the way Anise. they lived, yeah, and the way they lived their life, they were just like so Simple. there for the community, and they just had so much love to give, and they just represented love. And you could go in front of them. It was a new way for me to be, because up until that point in my life, for me, it was like if you sit with someone religious, you're going to be told off. You know, we told about why, you know, what hell's like and stuff. Mm-hmm. And for her, I just, I felt pure love, and that was that first seed that was planted where I just thought, wow, this is Islam or. Religion can be love. Mm. Do you still <laughs> speak to her? She passed away. She passed away. Okay. That was really sad. Okay, fine. Number that's person number one. Number, number two Anise. is um, an American uh, psychologist called John Bradshaw. John He's Bradshaw. also passed away. He passed away a few years ago. I really wanted to go to America and meet him. Uh-huh. He re- did some groundbreak, I believe, groundbreaking research on shame and the impact that it has on people. He wrote this amazing book called um, "The Shame That Binds You." Uh-huh. And it is literally, as the title suggests, uh-huh. about how we can go through life metaphorically being bound by shame. Oh, wow. And that for me was a real eye opener. He talks about the family system. He talks about how secrecy are like poison to the family line, how family secrets never remain hidden, that the poison seeps out into generations to come. He talks about gen- intergenerational trauma. And which is now proving to be true scientifically that our genes are altered by the trauma that our ancestors yeah. went through. Did you see that piece of research about the uh, partition? That, yes. Do you see that? That was amazing. So people who whose ancestors has, have gone through the process of partition, India, Pakistan uh, and Bangladesh later in the 70s, um, their family are affected by the trauma 
like later on in generations. That's incredible, right? It alters DNA on a cellular level. That's <sighs> mad. That is mad. Wow. That is mad. That is mad. Like yeah. this isn't just habitual. These aren't just habits that are being passed down or, or folklore or word of mouth or this is how my mum raised me. This is actually on a DNA level. Level, yeah. There are people, there's been research done by, there's this other researcher called Gabor Mate. He does a lot of stuff on trauma and that kind of thing. And I think it was one of his talks, he was talking about this man who went to his therapist because he kept like having difficulty breathing and kept passing out and stuff. And he didn't know where he came from. He was adopted, had no clue what his family history was. So he decided, of course, to go on that investigative hunt on his family history, found that his ancestors, somebody in his ancestors, was in a gas chamber in the Holocaust. Oh my God. And that's why he was exhibiting those symptoms. Wow. That so is imagine and knowing what my, the women in my family have been through and knowing that until I have addressed it, uncovered it, muddled through it all, that I will continue to pass it down to my kids. It is my responsibility to change those patterns, to wow. change my family tree. It's powerful stuff. That is powerful. So Sister Ennis, John Bradshaw. Yeah. Third person. Cool. J-Lo, I think, is pretty... Okay, why? As a woman, because she's normalising being over... What is she, 50? Yeah. Um, yeah, she's normalising being visible and being present. I mean, arguably, the expectation is up here because she looks like she's not 50. But to be able to look after yourself at that age, I think, even if you take the good from it, right? She's looking after herself. She's living a life. Mm. She's visible. She's not just curled up in a corner somewhere dead do you know what i mean which is what people expect women to do just shut up and disappear after what 30 even after 25 in this industry yeah if you weren't doing this job what would you be doing maybe i'd still be teaching i don't know what, what were you teaching biology i'm a science teacher oh wow I was a science teacher. okay i didn't know that wow so you'd probably be teaching if you weren't no actually i was Probably would have left. I don't know. Maybe I'd be studying media. I still wanted to go into TV. Because how, how long does a social media content creator, uh, or just generally a social mm. media influencer, how long do they uh, think their career is, like their career span? Genuinely, I don't know. Like we're a social experiment. Mm. When does it run? I don't know. I'm always prepared. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, could end tomorrow, and that's fine. It is what it you is. You don't have like a five-year plan or... I don't. I should do. It's what people say. But I'm like, okay, let's just go with the flow. But then the other thing is your audience is, they say, you know, moving along with you. So mm. you always have that audience to go on your journey with you. If I were to ask you um, what, uh, in your opinion, is spirituality, what would you say? Like, what does it mean to be spiritual? To I think it's to... Uh, know and to feel that your soul is there and that is the ancient part of you <clears throat> the ancient part of you that existed exists and will continue to exist let's say it's like that and it's never gonna end yeah it's the like being aware of that that you're a soul creature more than anything else to me and that is it that the, the so it's anchored, the root of that soul, its existence is with God. It continues to stay with God and it will go back to God. Like to me, that's spirituality. It's that, oh. almost that continuity and that fluidity between what was, what is, and what will be. And like that and part it, of us. And it all just, it goes round and then it ends up where it started, which is with I God. I believe back with God, yeah. Back with God. Okay, we've spoken about spirituality. Uh, but I hear you like to talk about like supernatural, spooky things. I mean, I, believe, boards. I don't talk about it that much, but I do believe that it exists. What exists? Oh my God, mate, I was into all of that growing up. Were you? Fully obsessed. Proper Hyderabadi uh, Let, Let's not assign vampire. it. Vampire. No, no, no. <laughs> we won't ascribe it to being Hyderabadi. I'm not wearing a tinfoil hat. All of that stuff exists. I did the raising of the person but, and uh, what do you, uh, Ouija board uh, like what do you believe in like obviously it's, <laughs> obviously it's gins isn't it but growing up I was like my parents I said I don't care if it gets haunted whatever let's do the Ouija board I wanted to go to Bradley did you know this before you <laughs> sorry babe I've never done it in my house though it's alright it's probably one lurking in my parents house 
<laughs> Probably because you're snoring. Okay. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> what? Let's give you a little bit of a break. <coughs> laugh, laugh, don't take your time. There's an experience that people tell me about when you went to school. I want to know about that experience. Oh my God, you're going to title this Amina and the ghost or something yeah. and make me out to be a nut. Okay, when I was at um, primary school, I convinced my friends to do the Ouija board with me. I kid you not, this is exactly what happened. I got people to back this up, okay? So we were in the cloakroom, me, and like three other girls. Picture normal, this. No, the normal cloakroom where you put your jacket. Primary school, yeah. cloakroom. Not a scary place at all. We've got a cover supervisor, I think. Okay. And so we sneak away. Uh -huh. I'm the, obviously I'm the nut who's like, come on guys, let's do the Ouija board. This is what you have to do to make it. And they've all signed on board thinking, oh, this is just going to be something to waste our time. So I made this. I'm not going to tell you how to make it because I don't want others to recreate this. That's fine. Carry on. There is a real hazard in this. We made it, we sat down, me and like one, two, three other girls. We're in the cloakroom, we do the Ouija board. Okay, imagine we've just finished. Eerie silence in the room as we're all waiting, anticipating, breaths held for the appearance of what we thought would be a spirit. Cause that's what the Ouija board does. We're waiting, nothing happens. So we breathe, I kid you not, we, breathe a sigh of relief like collectively we're like oh nothing happens suddenly we hear a sound like near the window or something and we all jump in our seats and then i kid you not systematically those posters that are stuck up on the wall each one fell down bup, 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 one after the other we screamed and just bolted out of there sure it wasn't just the actually wind? no they all screamed first i got up I was half crying, half laughing. So I got up, they were all screaming and I was like, listen, Wait, you know, I don't know what I was saying. I was trying to communicate with it, like don't harm us. And then I realized in my head, what the hell am I doing? And I just ran. So this all happened. I left them behind. In primary school. Primary school. I will never forget that. And I never did it again. I don't again. think I'm gonna ever forget that either. I never did it again. I had an encounter with a gin as well in my room one time. At uni? This was in my parents' house when I was, yeah. Yeah, legit, Tell me about there that. was something in the room. How do you know it was a gin? What else can it be? I, I don't know, but... There was like something, I don't know what had happened. I think I was trying to talk to it. I don't know what I was trying to do, man. I'm like, sorry, babe. <laughs> this is what you've married. It's too late now. Um, I was trying to talk to her. I was in bed by myself. It's a really gutsy 13-year-old. Oh, when you were, this was when you were 13. It's really little. And then suddenly, because I was like, oh, I think there's something up there. I was used to imagine something above the wardrobe. And then the plastic bag started moving and making a sound. Are you sure it wasn't the wind? And I was like, what did I do? How can there be a wind? Like in your room? In I mean, if the window was open. No, there was no draft. Could have been a giant rat, I guess. I guess. But you so felt guilty. as though it was a gin. Yeah, I, got, I had goosebumps anyway. And then I started praying, a prayer for safety, which is Ayat al Kursi. And at that time, I was memorizing it. Ah. So I was like, I kind of knew what I was saying as well. And then I kid you not, the next thing I, this was not a dream as well, okay, I was fully conscious. The next thing I know, it's morning time. I'd somehow fallen asleep and I woke up in the morning. I know you're going to think it's a dream. It wasn't a dream. Well, if you're saying it's not a dream, it's not a dream, but... Stuff exists, man. But why wouldn't it? Of course We it don't exists. know everything. Yeah, things do exist. Right? There's a different realm. There's a different world. We don't even know the entire ocean yet. Yeah, and exactly. And that's on Earth. Exactly. Do you believe in aliens? I don't, I don't not believe in aliens. Like, I've not seen any proof for aliens, but I've not seen any substantive proof against aliens. So... They could, they could be. I've not really looked into it much, if I'm honest. I do think there's different worlds, though. Like, mm. uh, and I go by, the, obviously, the verse of the Quran that Allah is in charge of different worlds. Plural. Who knows what that worlds mean? Mm -hmm. but apart from that, I don't know. Do you believe in aliens? Yes. I don't think that we're the only form of life that's been created. Um, uh, you're talking about different planets, right? Different planets, yeah. yeah. If there's one moment in your life, Amina, 
that you wish you could relive not to do differently but just that what this one day where you've had such an amazing day uh and try not saying your wedding day and stuff like that boring um because i'm sure your wedding day was great um, it was but i want to renew our vows okay, so for- we are going to redo that no no but forget that forget that forget that i had Some- so much pressure on me i was just like mm, no, no, but, no want tell to- me another apart from your wedding day okay. something that you just you remember having such an amazing time and you just want to relive that day um giving birth what to feel the process of labor again yep. dude you you will never experience the feeling of <laughs> I should, I should hope creating I new <laughs> life oh yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean That's i was in the room high. both times when my wife gave yeah. birth and i nearly fainted just you looking at her just cre- you did you yeah it was madness did you nearly faint? just screaming and just being nasty and rude to me she was like ah, just screaming it was just it wasn't a nice feeling uh but, but it was a nice feeling obviously when the I baby held the baby that that, that wasn't a very hey, good I miss mo- representation of what i was trying to say <laughs> uh, but, but um okay so giving birth yeah. Is what you want to relive. That's a trip. Why don't you just have another baby? That's a trip. Have another baby. I don't have any more babies. Because then I'll be like, oh, in the same position again, won't I? Mm. Missing it. But you'll never experience that. I will never f- experience that again. And up until that point, I had never experienced that depth of closeness to God and to like who I am as a, as a non-earthly being. It's just, it's wild. What's your biggest, never feel like that. What's your biggest source of strength? Apart from religion and apart from it your husband. It is though. It's like knowing that Allah's there. It okay. genuinely is. I don't okay. know what else to say to that. Right, fair enough. Okay. Um, if I were to ask you where you think you're going to be in 10 years or where you'd like to think you're going to be in 10 years, what would you say? Hubsy and I talk about possibly moving. To another country. Possibly. Yeah. Then just like being free spirits. In 10 years, you want to be traveling? Yeah, I'd like to be traveling. I'd like to be in a position where I can actually create more impact with the work that I do. I Uh hope to continue to do what I do. Uh I want to go more into TV and presenting and, you know, being more involved in projects. I want to do stuff with SPCC and Uh things like that. Interesting. So doing some impact. Things you're a bit passionate about, and mm. you can spare a little bit of time. Hundred um, percent. I've really enjoyed myself, Amina. Thank you. I really enjoyed myself too. And give my salam to your wife. You could tell me all of this later. Off the oh yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's been a really interesting chat. This is just one snippet, one example of how amazing the mix grill uh, as a platform is going to be different voices that are here to and send you, educate you, inspire you uh, and hear things that you really, really, really want to hear, things that you want to talk about. Um, we've got loads of amazing guests alongside Amina that will be appearing on the podcast. Uh, we want you to subscribe. We want you to share this with everyone you know. So your uncle, your auntie, your dog, your dog's neighbor, everyone you know, just tell them the mixed crew.